Hi, I'm Glenn Waleshka here in Vernon, British Columbia, and I'm here today with Daryl Stinson, who was the Member of Parliament for North Okanagan Shuswap from 1993 to 2006, I believe. That's right, yes. And we're here today to talk specifically about Maverick Party. Uh, we've, we've had political parties in the past who have started with the intent of representing the West. However, for a, a variety of reasons, those political parties didn't totally succeed, although you did uh, represent this riding as a member of parliament for the Reform Party That's right. originally. And I think uh, a little bit of the history that goes back with that might be in order. Well, we, we, we started with the understanding that the Reform Party would be a party that would represent the West and the West only. We were not originally to go beyond the mantle of the border. We were sick and tired of the East controlling the West. And that was our answer to it. And we became the official opposition in the House of Commons. And then some people got the ambition that we should spread out. I was not one of them people. Uh, that we could eventually take over government. But in order to do that, you have to, as they said, put a little water in your wine barrel. Well, you put a little water in your wine, you no longer have wine. Right. Okay. Once you start that, you never stop. You always have to give, 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 give part of what your stance is. Yeah. And this is what we did, unfortunately. We had a good shot at it when Stephen Harper got in. We really did. Um, unfortunately, um, it didn't last long enough. And we had given up uh, quite a bit of what we stood for back then too, even, even with Stephen, unfortunately, Mike the Keep is probably the greatest Prime Minister we've had in a long, long time. But when it comes to the West being represented, we lost that. The East controls us. When you stop and, and, and you think of this now, we've had 24 or 25 different Prime Ministers. Okay. And that's not saying the ones that run successfully for three or four terms. That's different Prime Ministers we've had. And only four have come from the West, four or five come from the West. And one of them, you, you take uh, 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 Campbell, she only lasted three weeks or six weeks. Yeah. So, I mean, does that really count? And, 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 there, and there was another one. So, their total attitude then is towards these, they cater to the East. Okay, that's where the votes are for them. Yeah. And they forget about the West. No, people would only remember we supply the money to the East. They take our money on mineralization, on our timber, on our fisheries, on our oil and gas, on our wheat. They take that. And then they tell us how we're going to live and how that money is allotted out to Canada. You have a province like Quebec that gets everything they pretty well ask for because they're under the assumption that they're going to separate. They're not going to separate. But it's time somebody stood up to them. It's time the West said, hey, look, we're in this. We are feeding you back there. We are allotting you this sum of money. But you don't care about our jobs. You don't care about what happens out here. I mean, when you can lose 25,000 jobs between Vancouver, or between um, Alberta and Saskatchewan, the oil patch, and there's nothing done about it to say. But you lose 200 back in Quebec. And the federal government's right there to handle for them. Look at after them. Yeah. How, how do you think that resonates with us people out here? Yeah. It, it, it doesn't. Well, the, the problem was was a problem right from the get-go, and it really hasn't changed. You know, even today, almost seventy percent of the population resides in the east, and seventy percent of the MPs are elected in the east. So, if you're going to represent your constituents, you know, you pretty much have to look after the people that uh, brought you into office and. You try to be a Western party that goes East and all of a sudden now you have a, an Eastern centric caucus, uh, you're, you're, you're back into the same boat that, that we are right now. So we've made the determination that we're not going to cross the Manitoba, Ontario border as Maverick party. That's got to be the focus. It's got to stay that way. And it's going to be written into the constitution. Yeah. And that has to be done. That has to be done and has to be cast in stone. I mean, it, it is time that we stood up for ourselves. I mean, I'm, you know, you, you talk about the majority of MPs, or at least this is true. 
and they represent smaller areas than we do. Like, I mean, when I was back there, they had the MPs to represent maybe uh, 10 blocks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and here I got, Toronto. yeah, I got uh, 160 miles, you know, and they get paid the same as what you get paid. Yeah. And we have to travel when we come home by airplane, they can drive the cars. And, that, and it takes us, I mean, yeah. I, I've been caught in airports overnight yeah. having to stay and that there. And it's not fun. You know, but you don't mind that if you could see things done being done fairly for your part of the country. Right. But when you see what what happens, and and now you're outvoted back there, it gets a little bit tiring. It, it really truly does. Uh, I would not not doubt that in the least. I guess what I'm really concerned about, and what a lot of us are concerned about, when we started Maverick Party, is that. We've got a, a federal government that's now pushing us up to one and a half trillion dollars in debt. I, I don't see any accountability in, in the House of Commons right now. With the, you know, for all the rhetoric that we get from the Conservatives and from others at this point in time, when it comes to passing some of these huge money bills uh, and, and trying to fix things like equalization, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's no discussion of that from any of the major parties at this point in time. Nobody's trying to put the brakes on. And in fact, they can't even hold the government accountable. And it seems like we're almost running our own little, you know, our own little third world dictatorship here because nobody in, in opposition seems to have any ability to affect any kind of change. Now, is there something that they're not doing that they could do constitutionally? Or is, is the constitution itself broken from the perspective that there is nothing that a minority government opposition can do to hold the government to account. No, it's broken. It, it absolutely is. I mean, when you stop looking, you, you want to talk about the debt. Here's an example of it. It's the oil patch right now. Okay. They stopped the pipelines. They won't allow pipelines into Quebec. Quebec won't allow pipelines into there. Yet, they take the most money from the oil and gas out of any province. Let's go back. Now, they'd sooner buy their oil and gas from countries Saudi Arabia. But, yeah, have no use for their women. Their, their female children can't go to school. They'll stone them to death. But that's, to them, is good. Clean oil. They don't even have the restrictions we have in the environment. But they'll still buy it from there. But they'll take our money. They'll take Alberta and Saskatchewan's money on the gas and oil. Oh, with a smile on their face. And then tell you, you can't come through here. Now you stop and you figure out how much we're losing to pay the debt down just by cutting off that gas and oil. How much money are we losing? Stop that gas and oil, it's helping pay for your policing, your hospitalizations, uh, your armed forces. It was probably the biggest payer of anything in Canada going towards that. Now it's no longer there because the feds can't stand up for Western Canada. Now, can't or won't? <laughs> I they guess won't. this becomes the issue. Eh? They, they, they won't. They can do it, but they won't. I mean, if they could stand up there, if they would stand up there and say, okay, come back. Fine. You don't want the pipeline coming through here. You get no money. Seems fair. Only fair. Yeah. It is only fair. I mean, but that's not what happens. And he, even here in British Columbia, you know, we, we, we have pipeline expansion being held up by a provincial government that has no constitutional say in the matter. That's right. And yet, one extra tanker that would flow out of Vancouver's yeah. harbor yeah. is being shut down, yeah. providing more economic wealth and, and prosperity. But for every tanker that we have shipping out of Canada, yeah. there's 10 that are coming out of Alaska down that same coastline. That's true. <laughs> I, I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, and, and another great example of, of what's, what happens within our political system is I spent all one summer going to businesses. I mean, big businesses, logging companies, mining companies, asking them if they could start an apprenticeship programs, if they would build schools to teach kids. Because not all kids are academics. I was never an academic. I worked all my life. Okay. They said yes. They were willing to build big places, get free, get free uh, to, to the kids, to, 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 to learn, learning. free, everything, supply everything. 
They only wanted the right to pick the top people for their company. I take this back to the federal government, the liberals at the time. They said, no. I said, what, why? what are you talking about? They said, there's no way we're going to allow that to happen. And I said, well, why not? Because you have to have so many of this, so many of that. You can't. Diversity. That's right. It has to be. So many people have to wear glasses. So many people can't wear glasses. So many people have to be left hand. So many people have to be right hand. You know, this becomes stupidity now. This becomes when, uh, when companies are willing to put up hundreds of millions of dollars and employ people to build these places. And to improve the standard and of living, the, the lifestyle. E everything. But I mean, that's just, that's the that's really expert. Mm -hmm. I spent two years going down to the states talking to senators and out there. They come to me and, and they said, Mr. Stenson, here's what we want to do. We want to create a highway system from Southern California through to Alberta, or through to Alaska. Okay. We will pay for everything. Everything. We will use Canadian labor to build the highway. I go back to the federal government, I think, gee, you know, this is a great idea. It's employment, it's everything. Yeah. I go to the federal government, who was underneath the uh, uh, correction at that time, and I said, listen, this, this is what they're offering. They said, there's no way we will allow any outside interest to invest more than five miles beyond the border. I said, what are you talking about? This is crazy. And yet, in 2020, we have foreign corporations that are buying up resource companies yeah. that are mining our gold, mining our petroleum, yeah. uh, bringing their own labor yes. force in, yeah. and in BC or into yeah. some of the mines, yeah. so that that whole concept of, of Canada first and Canadian <laughs> workers first just went right out the window. Yeah, right? it's gone. I mean, it, it, it's gone. It, it's uh, if we only knew how much money even China had invested in Canada, it would scare you. It really would scare you. Well, you can see in the Lower Mainland, right? Yeah. And, and what happens here is, to, is that they invest our pension plans into them, these programs. So your Canadian pension plan, your senior citizen pension plan, is not controlled by Canada anymore. That's right. It's controlled basically by foreign companies, whether or not they, 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 they make a living. And why? Why do we supply the product? Why do we mine the minerals? find the gas and find the oil and ship them out to other countries yeah. to finish off. And then we buy back the product at three times the price we got for selling in the product. Yeah. Does this make any sense to you? Yeah. Well, our kids, well, our kids do without, well, we don't get the education. Why do we spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. to educate children around the world that yeah, we don't get free education to our children? Well, I, I looked for a while on the island and I was watching 90% of the raw logs leave the harbors over over to uh, the Orient oh, yeah. for processing. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> and as a result, you know, pulp and paper mills shut down. That's right. Uh, your, your plywood mill shut down. You know, the labor force yeah. itself yeah. became nothing more than the guys fell in the trees and, and running the trucks to get them back into the harbor. That's it. You know, so we've... we've, we've almost destroyed that industry because we're only doing primary production on secondary tissues. And and we, we can't exist like that. It, it, there's no future for Canada like that. You know, you can't offload all of your your production uh, on on the the global stage because the United Nations is telling you that's what you have to do. That's right. We have a very compliant government. I mean we, we have we have Trudeau, who wanted to be the first post-national prime minister, and he is. There's, there's no question. And we, we can't allow it to continue here in the West because essentially we're being raped and pillaged. We don't, we don't have the opportunities. We're going to be picking up our share of the phenomenal debt mm -hmm. that's being created, and yet we have no control over our own destiny. That's right. right? It's, it's true. We, we don't have any decision making process here that, that's meaningful because of the split between East and Western Canadian. So, so in order to fix that, we're hoping that Maverick Party is the latest and hopefully the last federal entity that's going to work towards uh, self-determination for Western Canada. And in order to do that, 
we need the support of far more Western Canadians who are aware of the problem, who understand the economics of it, who understand the mathematics of it, who understand the, the impact on their social, political, economic lives going forward if we don't fix this problem and fix it quick. So how do we, as, as a new fledgling political party, get the message out to Western Canadians? What's the best way that we can think of for us to do that? The same way that reform bill. We did it with one-on-one, -on -one. we did it with coffee meetings, we did it with education to people. Right. And that's what you have to do. You know, you no longer leave it up to John and Susie. Okay. It's time you go off your butts. Yeah. And our problem here is we've become television butt pieces, basically, put it bluntly. We won't get out there. We, we'll stand there, we'll sit, and we'll complain, and we'll do this, and we'll do that. But we won't do anything about it. You know, they say we're nice Canadians. I'll tell you, you know how you can tell the Canadian when you're overseas? Do you know how to tell it? To go and say thank you to, to a money machine. <laughs> that's us. That's, that's the definition of a Canadian. Yeah. And it's time we started to stand up. Our kids are losing out on this. You know, people are age, you know, I mean, I've got a pension and all that there. But what are the grandkids and what are the children going to have? Yeah. What are they going to have? Stop and think about it. What's been lost since you were young? And how you can make money for the rest of the day? Yeah. We're losing it every day. We're losing something. Yeah, and we can't allow it to continue. Uh, it's, it's not going to improve unless somebody takes the bull by the horns and does something about it. Well, you have to, because you're losing the family unit. Okay, yeah, and, and that's the name of the game. The family unit is the most important thing there is. Yeah. And if they can break the family unit, you lose your country. And of course the government's already starting to do that. They, they passed legislation this last week that prevented parents from allowing professionals to counsel their children when it comes to transgender and gender reassignment issues right kids, kids you know I, I raised three kids and they all turned out wonderfully eventually yeah but there's a period of time oh, yeah. in no. which they're very very confused young people sure. yes. they have no concept because they haven't matured yet they, they haven't you know a male's brain isn't supposed to fully mature sometimes until we're 25 and my theory is a lot of male brains have never matured fully, but that's that's another story. Uh, some are in politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, most on the uh, on the on the yeah. <laughs> side of the of the majority government at this point in time. But you know, you don't have the ability to make a, a sound decision for the rest of your life when you're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Oh, yeah. And what really bothered me about this this bill that just passed preventing parents and actually making it illegal for them to try to get counseling for their children to at least delay making that decision. Once you're an adult, fine. Right? You know, you make up your own mind when you're an adult. But when you're not an adult, you're called a minor for a reason. And you're under the supervision of your parents for a reason. And for the system to be taking the power away from parents and the family and turning that power over to the state just scares the hell out of me. Me too. It absolutely does. Uh